All righty, righty. Uh, welcome to the fourth episode on this channel of Bad Combat News. Uh, this was a series I actually started months ago and haven't had the time really to commit to. Now, while this is going to start out a little bit basic, so feel free to rip me for that. I do deserve it. I'd like to at least get rolling again on reacting to news that goes beyond just the fights themselves. So let's get back to it and have a brief overview of the major MMA headlines over the last few days where I'll share my views on some of the more interesting, relevant, maybe that's debatable, and let's be honest, downright strange goings on in this wacky, degenerate sport we all love and sometimes hate in equal measures. Uh, let me know what you think in the comments and if this is a series you want to see more regularly, hoping to get to the point where I can up the production values and roll this out daily, but I have to start somewhere, so let's go. All right, first thing I want to take a look at, uh, in a recent presser after Dana uh, White's Contender Series on Tuesday, I believe this was number six of the season, uh, Dana White was pressed once again on the status of Conor McGregor's return to the Octagon and when this was likely to happen regarding a potential uh, bout with Chandler. Now, we all know McGregor's been vocal consistently in saying that he's going to be fighting this year, but let's be real, that guy's got a reputation, uh, well, his reputation for speaking the truth is firmly in the gutter or the toilet. You get the point. And the fact he won't have been in the USADA pool for the allotted six months, I don't think he's entered into it yet, which we all know is a crock of shit anyway, further undermines this bout potentially happening anytime soon. Now, Dana has been quoted as saying the bout is likely to take place in the first quarter of 2024. I'm going to call bullshit on that one as well. I've said this before, and I'm nothing if not consistent. I firmly agree, uh, believe McGregor's never going to fight again. We've been at a point with him for a long time where it was basically shut up and fight. Now it's just shut up. He's not coming back. And you know what? He's washed. Clearly has his head on other things. And personally, I don't even care anymore. Now, I will say this. If I did have his money and uh, his achievements in the game, I wouldn't get back in there with these hungry killers either. He clearly can't and shouldn't risk getting his bell rung anymore. And you know what? I kind of salute and respect that. All right. Now, on to the Strickland and Adesanya situation, which has obviously been making headlines over the last week. Uh, I made a few tweets regarding the aftermath of this bout. One in particular alluding to the idea that a major Adesanya excuse for why and how he showed up on Saturday night and got absolutely piped in one of the biggest championship fight upset, upsets of all time was coming. I was thinking he'd draw for maybe health or injury issues, overlooking his opponent, a family bereavement maybe. However, it's been almost a week, the dust has settled, and the only insight we've really had has come in the form of the hilarious motherfuckers that have decided to break down what was said between the two men in the post-fight interaction, which for me was really telling. Now, among these highlights, Adesanya can be clearly heard saying, and I quote, don't ever joke about my family, bro. Sure, uh, that's a bit rich coming from him, but I can fuck with this sentiment before it then takes a more sinister turn where he then says, and again, I quote, look at me. I know you think I fucked my dog. Now, all right, firstly, wow, I thought it was just a wank. Anyway, the fact that this is the first thing he uttered after losing his belt demonstrates how much it, effect, much it affected him uh, leading into the fight. I guess just don't do that kind of weird shit in the first place. How this didn't come to light before or only occurred to him after the fact? Remember, the dog wank wasn't a leak. He posted it. It's, it, it's something that needs to be delved into. Is he really that arrogant or was he just unaware? I will also add that he finished this interaction by virtually begging Strickland to ease off and that he would never do that to him. Again, to me, that's just hilarious and ironic. Uh, for me, uh, you know, especially from a guy that's humped an opponent when he's down, fired shots on a downed opponent, mocked a child, race baited, and talked endless reams of personal and beyond borderline disrespectful and cringy shit in presses. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. I'd be here all day listing this man's indiscretions. Now, Adesanya seems perfectly content to play this game as long as the boot is on the other foot. And to ask for mercy, uh, to, and to ask for mercy after all the shit he's done is objectively funny to me. If you can't take it, don't dish it. Anyway, it was interesting to me that a week later, it was clearly the dog molestation narrative that seemed to remain at the forefront of all this shit. All right, now we've had a few fighters removed from the roster this week, uh, officially on Roster Watch, including Zara Fern. What a shocker. I brought up the idea rather tongue in cheek a few months ago on Twitter that the UFC should just have pink slip matches at this point, where two fighters on losing streaks face off and the winner gets to stay, loser gets shit canned. Cruel as fucked, but at least we would be more honest and would make uh, some more of the less important bouts have greater stakes. Now that they're aligned with WWE, <laughs> I bet it's going to have been discussed. Anyway, I digress. Now we know the UFC can be fucking ruthless at times, but for me, the release of Derek Brunson this week 
was a particular surprise, and I'm going to assume there is more to this than appears on the surface. Yes, the man has lost two in a row to du uh, Duplessis and Cannoneer. They're both at the top of the division. But before that, the man was on a five-fight win streak and has only really lost to some of the best in the division in general. I'm assuming something must have happened that pissed the UFC off regarding the potential matchup with Delizze that was called off recently. But to me, this is a little strange and downright shady on the surface. I don't understand this one. And unless something major comes out in the coming days, I'm calling out the UFC riding dirty for this one. All right, now on to fighter pay, something that I'm personally a big advocate for, and that few can really de uh, deny at this point is a massive issue. After UFC 93, uh, John McDessey, who was fighting on the card, opted to release a breakdown of his USC pay, obviously with the intention of showing how severely he'd been taxed in Australia. Now, for those that don't know, you're essentially taxed a percentage on where you fight geographically, which to my understanding is why fighters prefer to take fights within certain states like Nevada, where taxation is a little lower. Makes sense. For me though, and perhaps uh, more unintentionally on McDessie's part, was this revealing of the breakdown was more in telling of how scummy the UFC moves regarding how they pay their fighters, including docking fighters for medical, medical and airfares, as well as quote unquote other miscellaneous expenses. Now, obviously many of us who follow the sport closely were aware of these disgraceful practices, but the opportunity to actually see this in black and white and so publicly has really shed a massive light on how horrific this pay structure really is and what the takedown for potentially is for fighters lower down on cards. Let's say you're on 10K to show and 10K to win, for example, and you lose. You're taxed 40%. And then after medical fees, miscellaneous fees, airfare, airfares, paying your corner and gym fees, you can genuinely leave with pretty much fuck all, if not a negative, after going in there in front of millions while risking getting humili humiliated and having your brain potentially scrambled. And I don't know, seeing this so stark in black and white makes it all the more disgusting. While this has some traction, for me, I think the media in general has done a really poor job of making a bigger deal of this as it should have been. I personally hope some of the bigger YouTubers like MMA Guru, Lucas Tracy, Jesse on Fire make the effort to highlight this because frankly, the media shills just won't. All right, now in the final piece, uh, in an episode of If Evil Was a Picture, finally, with the UFC and WWE merger finally taking place and the confirmation of the company now being floated as a joint entity on the stock market, the WWE market, uh, marked this event by announcing that they were going to, there were going to be some major layoffs in what for me is a major foreshadowing for what we can expect in the coming months. Now, personally for me, I think this is a match made in both heaven and hell. Both companies are uh, separate operate in similarly shady and successful ways and are far more an ideal fat, uh, fit than a lot of fans are potentially willing to accept on this one. Now, I only bring this news up because while I no longer watch any WWE or related products, I'm no longer 12. There's no denying that the potential synergy between both companies is going to have massive implications on both sides. And I'm curious to know what some of you might think these might be. How much are things going to change? How much will they stay the same? Genuinely curious to know your thoughts. All right, anyway, I'm going to bring this one to a close. Let me know if you want to see more content like this and uh, catch you all in a day or two. I'm out.